Hello everyone. Welcome to our monthly live stream. This month we are going to do a Q&A style live stream. I have got lots of Power BI, Power BI related questions that are pre-submitted by our audience as well as whatever questions that are coming up now. I'll kind of address them for the next sometime. <laughs> so before we jump into anything, let me know in the chat if you can hear me loud and clear and uh, and then we can kind of get started once there is no audio issues. As always, what I will do today is apart from answering the Power BI questions, I thought, you know, we could do a quick roundup of what is really new in Power BI and share maybe three or four quick updates on Power BI that are happening. Um, so, yeah, Akshay says, yes, we can hear you, Anna. That is great. Thank you so much. And um, we will get into the questions uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, first of all, I would like to officially and formally welcome you to the Q&A live stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and, uh, you know, this is uh, the first live stream I'm doing <laughs> uh, in a while. Um, I had one at the start of the year and then another one. And then I went offline for the live streaming part, mainly because I had my braces. Um, but I'm glad I'm doing them back again now. Uh, and um, so let's uh, go ahead with this. Um, I have got Power BI open on the other screen and I'll jump there to do like a quick roundup of what's going on in the world of Power BI. What are some of the new things that are happening in that space? Uh, Microsoft uh, recently had their annual um, developer conference kind of a thing. It's called Microsoft Build. Uh, and they made lots of amazing announcements on Power BI platform. So I'll share some of those things with you and, you know, bring you up to speed. Uh, Akshay also sends a super sticker. Uh, thank you so much for that love, Akshay. And um, uh, meanwhile, you know, we uh, before we get into that, let me know from the chat, where are you watching this from? Uh, and I have also put a poll there, uh, so feel free to let me know how often you use Power BI. Um, oh, uh, one of our regulars, uh, Pia Beder says, uh, welcome from North Georgia, US. How are you, bro? And, um, and this is uh, Shamuil says, hello, how are you, sir? I am Shamuil from Bangladesh. And we have got people from Bangalore, Noida, uh, UK, Dubai, you know, kind of like a little bit of everybody in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of the regulars of our live stream as well, like uh, Philip, uh, Hawaiian Airlines, it's 17P. <laughs> I hope you're not watching it in the plane, but that will be something if you can watch and, you know, the stream quality is good up there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, we got uh, Saurabh from Maharashtra Pune uh, and uh, Saeed from Somalia and uh, Janith from Vizag. Uh, Vizag is where I used to live. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, hey, Janith, uh, I hope everything is all right there. And, um, and Edwin from Philippines. I have never used Power BI. That is great to hear. Um, I'm going to end the poll and <laughs> uh, awesome. And um, keep the messages going. Uh, let me know what what is it that you're having. I just woke up. It's about um, 5, 5 a.m. in New Zealand now. And I made myself a nice big cup, cup of coffee and, uh, you know, looking forward to it. So the first thing that I would like to start by is kind of give you a little bit of what is going on in the Power BI space. Uh, the biggest announcement in the Power BI space in a, in a long while has been announcement of a 
kind of like a consolidated data platform from Microsoft. It is called Fabric. And uh, what Fabric is, it's kind of like an amalgamation of various data related stuff that are individually offered prior to that. And Microsoft put everything under one umbrella and then said, you know, this is Fabric platform. So imagine you are using Power BI to do some data analysis work. Normally what happens is Power BI is for doing data analysis and visualization, reporting, that sort of stuff. But you can't just do that alone. It's not like an island where that happens. You need to have quality data maintained on a on a pla in a place. So companies would have uh, some sort of a data warehouse or uh, a database or a data lake or something like that. And then while you are using Power BI, there will be other teams that will also use Power BI to uh, not, not Power BI, but that data to do other stuff like they might be running some machine learning models on the same data. Uh, they might be doing some SQL based reporting and stuff like that on that data. But because of the way these things are set up, occasionally what happens in companies is while Power BI would have uh, some sort of a role based access kind of a thing, these other things often don't have that. So they, they get to do everything on the, all the data and sometimes that can create some additional issues. So that setup needs to have replicated for those things as well. And likewise, uh, you will have a separate team, a team and a separate set of technologies to maintain the data. So you have your whole data engineering team that does all the data collections, ETLs, ingestions and all of that uh, using some separate tools and technologies. So as you can see what happens in a traditional business intelligence and data structures is you would have separate teams using separate set of tools um, occasionally duplicating the efforts and duplicating the storage duplicating the calculations and all sorts of things so this is where the fabric thing is kind of interesting uh, because it unifies all of these things uh, and introduces a single data layer underneath now it's called one lake where all your data is stored both the data tables and, and databases and warehouse as well as you know any any other stuff that you may want to keep there uh, so that's the one lake underneath and then all these individual technologies lined up on the top uh, to do data engineering data analytics uh, machine learning automation all sorts of things on top um, in a way you know it kind of brings together lots of things that were there separately before uh, and then kind of makes them all work together uh, and help you manage things in one place rather than multiple places. I have not personally tried Fabric yet because it's uh, still really new. Uh, I have only enabled it in my my admin portal on Friday, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, just took a look at what it is like. But that's the biggest announcement uh, you might see on Twitter or LinkedIn, lots of people talking about it. Uh, if you're curious, let me know in the chat and I might be able to, um, you know, talk a little bit more about it in upcoming videos uh, as I experiment and use the technology. Uh, let's, uh, um, let's take a look at uh, what is going on in the chat uh, and um, and then see what, what questions you have. So any questions you are posting, put them with a queue at the beginning because that way I can quickly spot them uh, and then uh, highlight them and then bring them, share my answers there directly. Uh, but normal messages, you can just message directly. So put a queue at the start uh, and then ask your questions. While you are uh, putting the questions there, I have previously asked you in the YouTube uh, as a post, if you have any questions, share them with me before the event. 
so many people have put some questions there as well so i'll pick some questions from there some from here uh, and in between i'll switch to power bi there uh, to talk about some of the other new things that microsoft has added into power bi so um let's see uh, one other thing that i want to highlight here is i may not know most of the answers in fact i probably wouldn't know many of the things that you're asking so there is no guarantee that i'll get to your questions or there is no guarantee that i'll give you the best answer or the right answer all the time i'm gonna try uh, but if you know in the chat uh, the correct way to address some of the things uh, help the person as well and if you have already posted a question and i didn't reply to you then please don't flood and uh, post the same thing again and again uh, it's just that maybe i didn't want to address it or i don't know the question so i'm not even going to talk about it so <clears throat> let's see uh, this is from satish uh, once we publish the report to power bi service which are the levels it should go through to reach the end user or stakeholder um normally you publish it then it kind of goes and sits in the workspace where you are publishing to um, but it might be a good idea to let your audience know that this has been updated uh, there are many ways to do this uh, one is if it's an ongoing report i think they can subscribe uh, to the report and microsoft uh, would automatically email them saying hey there is a new version or whatever uh, but alternatively you could also let them know that this report is now available for you to watch um it's like imagine you are using sharepoint in a team and somebody makes a change to a file uh, then how would you know they have changed it unless you are watching that file or unless you are have uh, they tag you into that file or something there is no way for you to know that that particular file has changed so same thing with power bi i guess uh, um and i hope that is the question that you are asking like what levels it should go through before it re reaches the end user um, because it's technically not reaching them it is staying in the workspace and it is for the uh, audience to see the thing um, preet says what is copilot in excel and power bi so copilot is uh, kind of like a built-in assistant feature that they have added uh, that that they are adding to these technologies like power bi excel and word and outlook and what not uh, it's kind of like a built-in chat gpt kind of a thing that would only work within your your data and your setup so it's not really uh, i mean unless you ask it explicitly i don't know if if it would go out to internet um, but for example you could use copilot within power bi to ask uh, hey given this data can you build me a report and it would build you some sort of a basic report with typical things or you can ask it hey can you write the dax for doing this particular thing uh, and uh, so far it is kind of like in a closed demo thing i have not seen it anywhere yet um, i feel like the fabric copilot they have done a lot of demos but again i am not seeing it when i open power bi anywhere so uh, and as far as excel copilot is it is still in a closed demo so only certain customers of microsoft were given access to this and they are testing it so there is a lot of marketing hype around it but in the real world the copilot doesn't yet exist uh, correct me if i am wrong but i have not seen it anywhere uh, out in the wild uh, the closest way to think about copilot is it's kind of like an enhanced help in office but the help will tell you how to do certain thing whereas copilot will actually do this stuff for you it will create the formulas it will create the dax it will create uh, graphs and what not and show you everything there mm. all right lots of questions there um some of which i obviously don't know so i don't want to highlight them and then uh, say that oh this is something that i don't know um
All right, RP says, what is Dataverse? Um, what is it really? <laughs> um, just to be honest, I have never used Dataverse, so I don't know what this is. Uh, I only know it by reading about it or hearing other people talk about it. Um, the easiest way for me to think about this is it's another place where you can store your data. Um, and uh, one of the trickiest things with Power BI and, um, and a technology like Power BI is it's kind of like always changing. So the word Dataverse wasn't there some time ago, uh, probably 12 months ago. I don't know how long ago they introduced it. And then initially, even when they introduced it, I believe it kind of looked different and then they changed the icons and whatnot. So it's always changing. And sometimes what it does or what its meaning is also changes. And this is where as a trainer who talks about these things, uh, it's always hard for me to know exactly what it is or what it is doing and talk about it. But then next month it becomes something else. So the easiest way in my mind, I'm thinking about Dataverse is it's a place where you can store your data. I believe it is something that uh, many places, they may want to uh, maintain the data, but they don't have like a proper database or something. They can, they can use this as an alternative. Um, but that is really as far as I know, I don't really know much about it. So if someone else knows it, put a chat message answering that, it will be helpful. Hmm. All right, uh, so there are some generic questions like that will be uh, just like the data, the Microsoft fabric that encompasses the whole of data real related stuff. Some of the questions are like they cut through a lot of things. Uh, and I see these kind of questions all the time. Uh, so I'm going to address one or two of these, uh, but I'll get into more specific ones as well. Mm, so this is the one of those generic questions, how to get a job as a data analyst and then optional criteria being you're a fresher, but it couldn't be that you're a fresher. It could be how to get the job as a data analyst with some experience elsewhere as well. Um, this will not be the correct answer for everybody, but generally you can take out all these words and put any other words, like how to get the job as a carpenter or how to get the job as prime minister or whatever else you want to do. Uh, the path is always more or less the same, which is uh, obviously you need to get some skills. So learn about the technology. Uh, and then you also need to understand the relevance of that job uh, and how it is helping the organization where you are going to work and, and then make it so that you become an interesting proposition for them uh, to, to hire. That's really at a nutshell. Uh, but if you break it down, let's say you're a fresher, you don't know much. My suggestion is while a lot of freshers get hired as a data analyst, uh, it might be like if I am a, if I am hiring for a data analyst, I don't really want to right away get a data analyst uh, from a fresh person, like a fresh graduate, because they data analyst, data analysis is not just about analysis. It's a lot about data. Uh, and the knowledge about data comes from the knowledge about the business. So you need to have that kind of an experience perspective or a gut feel about, about that industry before you can analyze the data. Otherwise, whatever you do becomes quite theoretical. Uh, so, and that is of less value. So it might be a good idea to bring in somebody with some experience. It doesn't have to be data experience. It doesn't have to be technology experience, but some experience in the real world uh, so that they have seen things, they have observed what goes on, and then they can relate that to the technology when they're doing the analysis. 
this is why personally i would prefer somebody with a little bit of experience in any other field if not in the data field uh, for the data analyst job but that's my preference uh, other companies other recruiters might might have a different way of looking at it so if you are a fresher then obviously you wouldn't have any industry experience any knowledge about business uh, so the only way you can make it work for you is you can show a lot of knowledge in the technology side so you might say i know all of these tools i know how to do these things i'm quite flexible i can learn about everything else but this is what i'm bringing i'm bringing that fresh perspective uh, can do kind of an attitude uh, i can uh, i can work hard i can learn and all of that so that is really how you can make yourself uh, and when it comes to learning stuff you know where the resources are you have youtube you have uh, various courses books forums platforms so whatever works for you pick some of those learn uh, and uh, you know make your technical side really strong and if possible go and work somewhere for a few years in in anything else because that is what you will be analyzing as a data analyst a data analyst doesn't work in isolation they have to know what happens in the business so without that knowledge their outputs and insights become useless uh, so maybe getting other experiences might be helpful and sometimes getting those other jobs might be also uh, slightly easier because um, they might be open to hiring freshers than a data analyst purely for these reasons hopefully that is helpful uh, we'll do one of more one or one of these generic questions a little time later mm. janith asks any changes in the code syntax this time um i don't think so i mean uh, the dax uh, i suppose you're talking about dax or m language coding has remained more or less stable they keep adding new functions uh, uh, one of the func set of functions that they're adding to power bi now uh, they have added in the last few months are called window functions um, i don't know how many of you have done uh, window stuff in sql but it's kind of like you have a set of results and you want to do something within those results uh, using like you know third one or top three and those kind of things then we use those window functions so similar stuff they have added to power bi dax through index and offset and match and a few other things uh, again to be honest and not use it them i only read about them uh, but they seem too uh, specific for certain things which i don't come across every day so i have not used them uh, All right, uh, there are lots of questions here. I, I feel like <laughs> uh, I may not get through everything, um, but uh, let's uh, go through the next one. rp says do power apps and power automate tutorials please thank you for that suggestion um i do have one tutorial on power automate uh, but it kind of talks a little bit about office scripts and how everything works together i plan to make more tutorials on power automate in the coming months uh, i use the technology a little bit every day uh, so that's something that i i am comfortable talking about i'll 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 make videos on that um how can you assign conditional formatting data bars on a matrix visual i believe it is not implemented in power bi i think that's a good question um we're gonna switch to power bi so we can kind of take a quick look at this and also do a demo of conditional formatting so let me um keep it like that and uh, share my screen and 
uh, this is the question from Kios, and I'm gonna hide your question so there's more space for everything. But and I got a demo file here. It doesn't really matter what file you are using. Um, so before we even get into your question, uh, quickly one of the key things that they have changed. Uh, there are lots of other changes that come every month. Uh, is uh, this new new area for visualizations uh, this is still i think on preview uh, sorry it's a preview feature so it doesn't get enabled unless you ask for it uh, but i have enabled it uh, so this is how you can now make a chart it's not in the panel here they're here uh, and when you make them you, know, you can do a lot of customization by right clicking directly there uh, rather than using the the panel on the side so let's make a matrix here. Uh, this is the one and um, I'm gonna put uh, something like department and uh, rating and uh, we don't have any measures. I'm just gonna add a new measure. And this is one of the things that I, I found annoying in this particular release of Power BI, which is I have this habit of right click and then use that to make a new measure. But I now realize that the first one is select instead of new measure, which is what it used to be the new measure on the top. But now it is demoted and we have this kind of select a table thing. Not even sure why we need to select tables uh, in the UI. I believe this is probably due to the new way of making the charts. Um, but uh, I found that annoying that now I have to go to the second one means I have to break my ha habit of clicking the first option on the right click. Anyhow, we'll make a new measure uh, for head count uh, is count rows of my staff table. And uh, let's uh, make it a number and let's bring that into the matrix. So this is a matrix that shows how many people are there by the department and by various types of rating. Uh, nothing extraordinary here. Uh, I think, you know, it's kind of clear from what it is doing. And the question was, how do we put data bars? So uh, if you click on that options there, uh, sorry, right click on it and then go to conditional formatting, you have got data bars there uh, and they will show up. So not sure exactly where you got the impression that we couldn't do this on matrix. Uh, you can add data bars on the matrix um, directly. So give it a try again. Uh, probably you uh, you found it. Okay, next one is. Sunita asks, is there any formula where there would be a variable which is the slicer basically? Please share if any. Um, I assume what you're talking about is called a parameter or a what if parameter. So if you go to the insert ribbon, um, oh sorry, in the modeling ribbon, you have got new parameter. This is exactly what, uh, what you're really asking for. Let's say if I put this in numeric range, uh, test parameter then it goes from 0 to 20 and you create you will have that you can just change this whatever this number is that will show up there and it will also be captured as a measure in your model you can then use that to do whatever you need to do with that number uh, so it's called what if parameter i have got a couple of videos on my channel that talk about uh, what if parameters and scenario based modeling within power bi so check it out and uh, you know that will give you more information on how this really can be used. Okay, this is an interesting question. 
why does the new columns added to tables using DAX doesn't appear in Power Query Editor? The reason for this is, this is like one of the most confusing things to people when they start learning Power BI. But the way to understand this is, your data, which is outside of Power BI, comes through power, comes to Power BI through three doors. So imagine you are uh, walking into a big palace and you have got gate one, gate two, gate three, and then inside is your palace. Once you walk through a gate, you are beyond that gate. So whatever you, ha you have, it's not visible to that gate anymore. So your data is outside. The very first gate is Power Query. You go, your data goes through Power Query and then it can it can be changed during that process. You can add columns, you can delete stuff, you can filter whatever you want. Then it goes through another gate called Power Pivot. And then finally it is in Power BI. So what we have done here is, we went through Power Query, first gate, Power Pivot, and then in Power Pivot you added a, an extra column. Now this information is only visible from that point forward. So it's, it can only be seen in Power BI, but not backwards within Power Query. So this is why uh, you, if you want to see the columns that you are adding, the best place to do that is either in Power Query or all the way outside. Like when you are bringing the data itself, add the column through SQL or whatever, then that will be visible. Otherwise, it will be confusing. So if you make a mental picture where you have got three layers or three gates, through which your data is moving, then it will be easy for you to relate to the whole thing. Otherwise, you will always make uh, assumptions that, oh, if I do something here, it would be there, but it wouldn't be there, then you couldn't do certain things. All right, lots of questions here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is switch it up and go to the bottom again, and then pick a few more. And again, please a reminder that do not <coughs> do not repeat your questions. You asked the question once. I see that in the pile here don't add more questions like the same thing copy paste again and again uh, this makes you look like uh, you know somebody who doesn't understand the basic concept of courtesy or whatever so please don't do that uh, you know i can't really help you if you repeat your questions um let's uh, say can you talk a little bit about pl 300 how to prepare for it etc again my answer for this will be completely incorrect but i'm just going to try um, I don't know anything about PL300. I have heard people taking it. Even my wife is planning to take it. So the other day we were talking and uh, you know about it and all of that. If you really want to learn about the exam, like what goes into it, what is the curriculum and how to prepare for it, I believe Microsoft has an official learning guide that you can read through, understand what is tested and complete the exam quite easily. If anybody has done this and got the certification, put a message in the chat and let us all know how it went and what are the things that you have done, what worked and what not. But here is my general opinion about PL300 or any other certification for that matter. Um, they, they're not like a make or break kind of a thing. Uh, if you are applying for a job. So the kind of questions that I get are, should I do certification? I'm looking for a job. Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so as a recruiter, I hired people for Power BI roles, Excel roles, data roles all the time. And what I look for is not having the certifications, uh, but if I'm talking to somebody and they have done a certification, it's just a signal to me that they they have checked one of the boxes. That That's as much as I value it. And it kind of shows that maybe they have gone through something and they know stuff. 
but what i'm really more interested especially when we are talking in an interview either phone interview or um online interview or whatever is to really understand what is it that they have done with the technology how they have used it so if you are finding yourself that you have done a lot and then somehow you're still not able to crack the interviews having that certification might help you but otherwise it's it's not going to make or break your application in most cases that is generally the perspective for me again i could be wrong uh, there might be organizations and companies that are hiring people that have the pl300 certification or whatever else is the certification so yeah mm, but if anyone has done this certification let us know in the chat where, how to prepare for it um hanan asks uh, thank you chandu for the wonderful tutorials uh, you're welcome hanan and uh, how can we add a column in power query and make changes that will adhere to the record and not move as the data updates okay so you are changing something within power query and then you want that change to remain even when you refresh and something in the source data changes uh, normally the way power query works is it's a rule based engine you are writing you are you are not really changing the data you are actually telling how to change the data so that's the difference so you could say if this column is x change it to y that's the rule that you are saying but if it is no longer x then the rule can no longer be applied so if your data after refresh it becomes z instead of x then because your rule says x becomes y but it doesn't say what to do with z uh, z will remain as it is so that's not how that technology is really defined what you could do is with the power query is not just in power bi it's also in other places uh, like the, with the fabric it, it is one of the etl uh, technologies as well uh, and what we can do with that is essentially change the data and then write it back or put it into a an sql database or something like that so maybe that is an option for you like you you use power query to change the data and then post that into a table and then consume from that table to your reports then what happens is new data comes only the new changes will go into the table not the overwritten kind of a thing i hope that makes sense but uh, yeah if you're just using within power bi because it's a rule based thing it doesn't really have that kind of an awareness um you might be able to do some sort of a very weird recursive thing uh, but i probably wouldn't recommend that mm. okay here is uh, another question that kind of encompasses the entire thing <laughs> is ai going to remove all the jobs uh, Uh, or all the MIS jobs, or all the data jobs, or is AI going to remove my job? I don't know. Uh, if uh, I mean, as long as you are asking this question to another human being, I think we we are safe here. Uh, but but um, it is also not not. I mean, it used to be amusing to watch the progress of AI, but now it is kind of like, oh my God, there we can do all of this with AI. Uh, that 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 is also. both bewildering as well as a little bit scary to be honest um, i mean as a, as a dad my kids are 13 years old now so uh, i watch them learn i watch them grow i watch them wonder and marvel at the world but at the same time i'm also thinking like a dad and thinking i wonder what is it that they're going to do when they when they're ready to work like what sort of options would be there Uh, because 
of that rapid change in the technology that we are experiencing in the last 6 to 12 months whatever it is that they are preparing for that world might not be there it might be a, a completely different world and what is it that you as an individual can do v very little to be honest i mean you can watch it you can adopt um, but we we are evolved to adopt things at a much much slower pace than than these kind of things like i mean it took us millions of years to stand upright uh, that's really how our dna works right it doesn't really change overnight fortunately we have the brains we we can think we can change our thoughts but everything else about us literally takes millions of years to change so um it 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 is it is an interesting thing to watch um, but i'm also kind of optimistic that you know there will be a lot of cohesive work environment where humans contribute a lot machines contribute a lot and together the outcomes will 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 be better rather than one of them working alone um, but we just have to kind of see uh, there is a very simple idea that i follow in my life which is if if something is outside of my control i don't even worry about it i just do my work and uh, let other things take care of themselves so this is one of those things it's not to say like an ostrich you bury your head in sand and not look at the world you can watch everything but you don't have to take all of that feedback into your head and overthink about this i don't really know man i mean we keep hearing stories about a lot of things getting done um, but also stories about how spectacularly these things have failed um, because of the way the technology works it might be another few years before it actually becomes like really solid we are i'm also watching just like you uh, but i'm i'm not really worried i like to play with technology rather than uh, get swayed by it mm. okay so Wow, there's lots of questions. So it's kind of um, this question that uh, I think another question was like this as well. How to use DAX to calculate lead time? Order was placed at uh, 23, 22, 0, 1 hours. Delivery time 0, 0, 21, 25 hours. Lead time, what is it? Mm. So one of the things that in the real world we think about is we know intuitively that 2 a.m. comes after 11 p.m. or whatever this is, right? Uh, but and we also think when someone says it's 5 a.m. we naturally know that 5 a.m. today but computers don't have that concept of time or date alone they they're always together so a time is attached to date that's how at least excel and power bi dax level stuff works now, power query on the other hand has a better handle on the time so you can actually keep time separate and maintain them so in your case the problem is because you, you you're going over the midnight and going into the next day uh, the calculations will be a little bit uh, kind of not complicated but they'll look a little bit funny if you just subtract what i recommend in in situations like this is instead of doing the calculation in dax do it in power query first calculate lead time as a column and then if the lead time is negative add one to it so that it fixes and uh, gives you the correct lead time and once that lead time is there, then use that lead time column in your DAX to calculate average lead time or uh, distribution of lead times or whatever. So that might be a lot better than uh, doing it uh, within the DAX simply because Power Query has an exclusive date 
data type, time data type, duration data type, and it works a lot better with these kind of things. All right, time to see. Okay, let's do another demo. There are some other questions, but I thought uh, I would like to show you what else is new within Power BI uh, as a, a thing as well, so that you know you are not missing out on some of the cool things that they are available now available to us. So one of the cool things, and this is something that people have been asking for many, many years, but finally it is now available within Power BI is ability to customize the data labels in, in the charts. So I'll show you what I mean by this. Let's make a column chart. And uh, here I want to see how many customer service tickets are there by department. So I add the ticket count. Uh, this is how many tickets are there by each department. Now, if I add data labels now, so if I go and uh, use this button and then add data labels, we'll get the data labels same as the value of the chart. So you get 139. Uh, I'll quickly customize this so we can actually All right, yeah. So you can see that 139 is the number of tickets for website. This is all previously available. But one of the things that people have been asking for many years is, I don't want to just see 139. I want to see something else as well. Like, you know, I want to see what, how many of 139 are high priority tickets. I don't want to plot that in the graph. I want to just have that as an extra label added there. So these are called, uh, you know, values from another another measure as the data label or measure driven data labels or whatever you want to call that. Um, that's what it is. So finally, Microsoft added that particular feature. Now, if you have got any other measure, you can put that measure as a label. Uh, so here in the model, I have got a measure called uh, high priority uh, ticket percentage, which is uh, calculate ticket count where ticket priority is five and divide that with the ticket count to get uh, the percentage of high priority tickets. And now I want to add that as a percentage to the label. So all I have to do is go here uh, and uh, I'm sorry, mm, no, format and uh, and from this there, so here you can see that it's called custom label as an option now. And if I enable that, I can add data uh, and I can bring in any other um, measure or column, whatever I want, I can bring that. And that will be the label. Obviously, you don't want to confuse your audience with just putting that. If you're doing this, you need to explain to them that you're using a different thing as the label, otherwise it will uh, mislead them. Like why is 14 more than 17? Uh, but that's because this is the total number of tickets and the label shows what percentage of that is high priority tickets. So this way you can actually increase the density of information you're presenting without creating different things or complicating the matters. Uh, hopefully you find this interesting and use it in some of your reports and videos, uh, sorry, or reports and graphs. Um, I plan to make a short tutorial on this later on showing how I will use this in a, in a dashboard or a report as well.
a Koima Okoli asks, I hope I didn't butcher your name there. Hi Chandra, I'm watching from Nigeria. Thank you for your videos. Can you discuss some Power BI interview questions? Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, for tuning in. So I've been thinking about this particular topic like interview questions uh, for a while now and uh, obviously I'll categorize the interview questions into two classes and uh, let's just uh, kind of go through some of the things that that I would ask. My focus especially if I'm in the last three or four interviews that I conducted has always been uh, really understand what is it that they have done rather than how much they know. This is pretty much how uh, for the level of positions that I hire, uh, the emphasis is always on what is it that you do? What have you done in Power BI? So we ask them situations and then they give examples and then we go into more of that. But let's just say uh, you you already know how to answer those questions because you've done that you know how to answer them so there is nothing mysterious there uh, but you are facing these other questions and you don't know how to answer them so then the second class of questions are about the knowledge of power bi and how would i test somebody whether they know enough power bi to do the work that we want them to do so in this case uh, the questions that i will ask will be slightly different, they will be a little bit more technical. Um, but again, because of the way most of the technology problems are solved in the real world now, which is let's say you ask me a question like, how do I write DAX for so and so? Either I know it or I know where to find the answer. Th these are really how most of us work nowadays you instinctively know how to use a count rows measure or if it's a little bit more complicated and you're not even sure how to work it you can go and search on the internet uh, use various resources uh, or the co-pilot kind of a thing to get what you want as long as you are capable of producing an output in either of these cases it, it also doesn't matter purely from a job performance perspective you should be able to demonstrate that you can you are resourceful and you can do it so again that is uh, that is the signal that i would look as a recruiter in the candidate whether they have that uh, i can do and i am resourceful kind of an attitude or not but in general the questions that i would ask <clears throat> at a technical level are simple ones like you know what is star schema kind of a thing uh, to more complex ones like uh, I'll give you an example of data. Let's just say one of the interview questions that I asked recently is we have got all these job titles that are like um, let's just say 1700 different job titles but we know from the fact that uh, they all fall into 12 or 15 different families of jobs. Just the text data is there. How would I go and tag them into one of the families automatically. We don't want to manually go through all the 1700 items. We just want to be able to tag things. How would I do this? What would the approach be like uh, within Power Query or within Excel or within Power BI, whatever is the tool of your choice. Again, the idea here is to see what is it that they know and how they can explain things. So that is, uh, those are some of the things. Um, one thing that I want to ask you all, whoever is watching live now and, and later on replay is, um, would you be interested in a, in a Power BI interview questions kind of a video? Uh, and if so, what things you would like to see there? What are some of the questions that you want me to answer and explain there? If you have got suggestions, put them in the chat or in the comments below if when you're watching in the replay. That'll help me kind of structure that. But uh, yeah, I've been thinking about it. 
um, because I was fortunate to be part of some interview panels and um, every time I do this I'm like oh maybe I should talk a little bit more about this as well um, All right, we had a follow-up thing from Kios um, about the data bars thing. You remember um, this one we, we had here. The issue is the data bars are calculated based on the max of the series and not max of the column total. Um, that is the default behavior. What you can do is, um, I'm just going to take out that parameter thingy what you can do is instead of um, i'm just gonna test out something and then i'll explain rather than yeah so Unfortunately, I think that is how it works because the data bar is tied to the cell value. So whatever is the value there, that's how much it will be. And then the scaling also is kind of like that. Um, I get what you mean, which is I want to see these two, three, two, three as like a bar against this cell so three will be the highest and two will be small and then when the when we go to this column it will have its own scaling and like that um yeah i don't think that is possible or at least i'm not able to figure it out quickly we can calculate a measure of two as a percentage of the highest value in the column and then plot that uh, print that value there but then then you will have that percentage instead of two. So you lose the context of two altogether. Uh, you might be able to reintroduce that as a different column in the matrix, but then that will make the matrix a little bit ugly with duplicate columns and whatnot. So uh, I don't think that is desirable. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's as far as we can go with those things. Uh, Lucky asks, hi Chandu, I live in Illinois and was wondering how the market opening is for Power BI developers with a couple of years experience. I wouldn't really know what happens in Illinois, uh, but uh, maybe look up on LinkedIn or whatever job search sites you guys use and uh, search for Power BI, see what jobs are coming up and, and if you have got any memory of what was that like a year ago or six months ago, you might be able to spot the trend uh, and yeah i mean in general the technology power bi has been growing quite rapidly in terms of adaptation so i would expect that if anything more companies would be looking for power bi people now than four or five years ago but it, there might be a lot of other things at play like the general economy and you know what's going on with companies and how much money they have for hiring and all of that. Manisha says, hi Chandra, I would like to learn more about DAX. For some reason, I feel overwhelmed when I see those lengthy DAX formulas. How can we make them simple to understand? Mm, that is a good one. I think uh, obviously I would be scared if I am starting how to learn uh, writing DAX today and then I see a really big DAX formula in my first week. I'll be like, oh my God, what is going on here? In fact, this happened many times in my life. Like when I first started learning SQL, I knew a little bit. And then after college, I started working 
and one of the first projects that I was put into, we had like an existing uh, Salesforce automation system and uh, and I am asked to build some reports on it. So I asked them, so what do you want here? And they said, yeah, here is uh, all the queries that we are running. We want you to figure out how to do this uh, with this new thing and, and then and those queries are like really this big in college you learn about sql with like simple stuff and then this query is like you can, if you print it it'll be two pages long <laughs> what is going on here why why is there so many things going on uh, but uh, sometimes like people learn differently like for me i feel like once i know the basics i always need to jump into the deep end and figure my way around uh, by looking at something that is really complex because that activates my mind more and then I learn faster uh, but if you are somebody who is overwhelmed when you are at the deep end uh, it's the clue that you shouldn't be there so get out look at simple ones first build your foundation stronger and then always test the depth uh, but don't be afraid uh, there is nothing wrong with being afraid of looking at complex anything really uh, it, it doesn't mean that y y you are incapable or anything it is how we feel like that's how humans work we look at complex things and we shy away but don't let that uh, that fear intimidate you learn it dax is not hard uh, if anything uh, you know with the advance of newer things that they're adding like the co-pilot and um, suggested measures and all these other awesome things mm, i hope there will come a day when we don't even have to write dax we just think what we want and 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 computer will produce everything for us uh, but uh, even if you don't that that uh, future doesn't happen at least we we can learn a lot of it quite easily without getting complicated in our mind i got many videos on the channel on DAX, watch them. If you like my style, you might find them quite helpful in building that confidence. Uh, but uh, you know, if you like someone else's style, find that person, watch from them, uh, or get a book and learn or practice a lot more. Give it some time, you will be all right. Mahmood says, uh, Mahmood from Saudi Arabia, can we load data from Excel table to database? Yes, you can load it as long as there is a way for you to go with that. Uh, for example, if you, um, the simplest thing would be like save the Excel file and then go to your SQL console or whatever uh, and see if there is an option to import a table. Uh, most of them would support CSV or Excel formats. You can just import. But uh, on a more automated route where you have got Excel data and you want to constantly load that whatever is added into SQL, you can either use VBA or probably Power Automate. I have not done that bit with Power Automate, but I believe they might have like some connector uh, which can connect to a SQL database and and execute the update or insert instructions there as long as you have the right permissions and everything is properly set up uh, that is possible another option is uh, with the the kind of like the new fabric thing they're adding more output points for your power query so rather than loading the data from power query to excel or power bi you can now load the data into a sql database or uh, something else directly so that those options are now also available so give them a try you might find something that works my says uh, namaste chandu thank you for your videos we appreciated your efforts thank you so much Mahesh, uh, for that lovely uh, comment and gesture really appreciate it uh, 
Akshay says, can you suggest some of the best projects to do in gaining intermediate to advanced knowledge on DAX functions? So this kind of falls back onto the previous question on DAX, like how do I learn? I'm feeling overwhelmed with that. Uh, and then this is, can you suggest some projects? Um, sure. I mean, the easiest would be pick up some solid sample data. I don't mean like go and get a millions of rows because with that, what happens is when you are learning a lot of what you learn needs to have a feedback loop. Like you're doing something, you get the feedback that yes, the result is right or the result is wrong. And to verify that you need to have manageable data. If you have like a few thousand rows, you can always manually add stuff up in Excel or something and then see, oh, the total in Excel is 4 million. Whereas my DAX says it is 6 million. Something is wrong. Whereas if you have got like 20 million rows test data, then it becomes really hard to maintain that feedback loop in your initial stages. So find some data that is complex enough, not but not too complicated. And then, and then what you can do is ask some business questions on the data. So what is intermediate or advanced DAX for you could be like elementary DAX for somebody else and vice versa, depending on which business they're in. Uh, like few years ago, I was doing a session for the Ministry of Education in, in Sydney, uh, New South Wales, Australia. And then during the session, I presented how to do Power BI to them and they were all quite happy. But at the end of the day, uh, one guy walks up to me and then says, hey, we got this data and I'm already doing this, but I got stuck here. Can you help me? And I looked at their da DAX and I didn't understand half of it because, you know, they were doing lots of advanced things, quite a, quite a lot of different functions that I rarely use. Uh, and uh, the formulas are quite long and, you know, they're doing something and the model is also quite big but for them that is the day-to-day -day -day stuff so they're already doing a lot of that uh, in in a very advanced thing but someone outsider for me it looks like this is complex but for them that is like oh this is just basic stuff but this is the advanced bit that we got stuck on uh, i was able to help them but the point being that there is no one advanced for everybody like for you calculate could be advanced but someone else it's like uh, i just have to use it every day so that's not the thing that i'm worried about so the best way once you find the data is go and ask the business questions and then figure out what dax is needed to answer them and add more questions or conditions to the questions as you learn or grow uh, a simple thing is like if you take the awesome chocolates example which is a sample data that i have on my channel you can find it in many videos and in uh, in places the questions that i would start by asking are the simple ones like what is your total sales how many boxes of chocolate we are selling uh, how many shipments we made and then next level is what is the sale per box uh, which countries are making more sales per box kind of a thing and then more questions more conditions to it like for example um, which month had the best sale for each product now this requires not just understanding the simple DAX functions like max or min but also applying them over a context of the products dimension or month dimension or whatever uh, to get the relevant month name and then using the iterator functions and all of that. And then you can add one more layer like, you know, what is the current value of the sale of that product as against the best month it had? You know, what percentage it is or, you know, those kind of things you can keep adding. At some point, they become so theoretical that nobody in the real world would ask those questions. So you need to always put that litmus test of, is this a question that I'm asking just for the sake of learning DAX? Or is this a question that in the real world people ask? And if they ask that as a sensible data analyst, would I answer it or would I go back to them and ask them, hey, have you considered trying these other things to get the answer? 
because that is really what you should be thinking about not writing DAX all the time but also thinking what is it that my business want and how can I help them most uh, so yeah uh, there are a bit of a long answer but hopefully that give you some idea of um, the relevance of DAX so this is actually the reason why most people when they s try to learn DAX and they see these complex examples it all confuses them and they'll be like oh do i need to know how to use that or this you don't have to uh, all the time but when you have to you will end up learning them anyway so uh, you don't have to start there every day you just understand and figure out how to ask the right questions and how to use what you know to help people because then slowly you will gain confidence and you'll be able to build more complex things um, Okay, this is an interesting one. For BI versus Tableau, which is better? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, I don't want to start a war or anything. So, <clears throat> we'll keep it a little bit more diplomatic. <laughs> it all depends. Um, if you are learning, my suggestion is learn both. Don't You don't have to play favors to anybody. Uh, neither Microsoft nor Salesforce is paying you to learn one technology so why not learn both uh, that's the best answer you learn both you then decide what works for each, each situation and then use it at a more uh, objective level if I am comparing these two technologies and then figuring out which one should we implement in awesome chocolates then I'll be using my own criteria, like for example, which one would be costing me more or what are, what technology features are there that we need that are offered by these two things. And uh, what is it that we are looking in the immediate term, next six months or next two years, which one can meet those things? How good are our people, whether they know these technologies or do I need to train them? If I have to train them, which one would be easier to try on? So all of those will be the criteria when a business decides Tableau versus Power BI. Uh, as a person who teaches things, for me, it doesn't really matter. I like both of them. They both have their own strengths. So for example, Power BI has got deep integration capabilities with a lot of other Microsoft things that most of the time companies use. Whereas Tableau has got a great community, longer lineage. It has been around for much, much longer. So people know it, they know how to use it. There is a lot more help online. Uh, the technology platform is quite stable. Uh, whereas Power BI every month it is changing. So it's hard to keep up versus something that is just like that for a while. So you know what to expect from it and use it. And uh, and the outputs are much more refined and polished because uh, the thinking from Tableau perspective is it's like a visual language. So we are, we are gonna create Tableau so that people can make better visuals. That seems to be the philosophy. Whereas Power BI seems to be uh, we are gonna make a platform uh, so that everybody can get on and start building stuff and whatever they want they can build. It might look beautiful. It might look clumsy. It might look intermediate. It doesn't matter but we are enabling people to do stuff. So those are some of the things you might disagree with some of my points of view and that is totally fine because this is an opinion, right? So all of us are entitled to have an opinion. It doesn't matter. I do have videos on both and I plan to make a couple more videos on Tableau because I'm learning, relearning it over the last one year uh, and as I grow I'll make videos on Tableau, but Power BI, I've been talking about it for a while. Kabi says, hi, Chandu. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for that shout. Uh, I feel like I'm going to disappoint a majority of you when I don't answer all of these questions, but uh, mm, I can only answer so many questions before I tire myself out. 
on an unrelated note let me share you something personal first and then we'll go back to questions um, i have been quite busy for the last couple of weeks on completely unrelated stuff uh, to technology one of the video games that i've been waiting for for the last year or two has released finally it's the legend of zelda tears of kingdom so i've been playing in fact we normally play downstairs on the tv but it was a little too much uh, and this game being new i'm like ah oh, i need to play it a lot more so i brought the whole whole setup here my console headphones and everything and i've been just playing on my second monitor uh, which is just plugged into the gaming console most of the time uh, <laughs> for the last two weeks it's gotten a little bit much but uh, i think i made lots of progress in the game and now maybe after one more week of playing i'll slowly switch back to my usual routine of working more than playing more but it is a really fun game so i'm enjoying playing that uh, and fortunately i knew this game is going to release on the 12th of may so i recorded and uh, released or scheduled lots of videos so you can see this in the board there nine videos are already created and set in the queue so that i don't have to stress myself for the next month <laughs> but uh, that's a little bit personal stuff um okay utkarsh asks this and i think this is a question that a lot of people ask again which is you have a lot of videos what is the sequence in which we should watch them i wish uh, it is a simple answer there is a simple answer to these kind of things i have got playlists that will give you most of the stuff in a way but when i make youtube videos i'm not really thinking people should watch this video after that video that's not how i produce and i'm pretty sure most creators are not really producing like that either there might be some people who will think like that uh, but it is not really uh, how youtube works uh, the the way youtube as a platform works is each video has its own merits and its own thing it's it's an island in itself uh, and it's in no way connected to anything else on your channel uh, and that's how they are they are uh, they are put out in the in the fr in in front of audience as well so for this reason for me to work best with youtube platform and and help more people i also need to think about content like every video is on its own i don't want to make this video somehow connect to that video and then another video because if i do that that's just not going to work at all like nobody will come across those videos because every week i make a video but most of you may not even see some of the newer videos that i publish because of the way youtube works youtube algorithm decides that oh you as mr x is right now interested in this topic so we are going to show you those videos not the videos from your subscription so uh, in a way it will be like you know a tree falls in the forest nobody hears did it really fall so the same thing happens to this videos if, if you make it like a series the seventh video in the series nobody sees that and hence it doesn't exist so then people come back and ask where is that it has been there for so much time but no one has seen it anyhow that that is the platform limitation not in creator limitation but for me the second problem with creating like that is it means i would need to be thinking about this for the last 13 years how long i have maintained my channel but that's not how people work right uh, over the time i might learn something new i'll make a video about it and the next month i might do something i'll make a video about that so life is a lot unpredictable we cannot plan like that sequence so there is no sequence of videos on my channel 
but hopefully the playlists give you enough direction and indication but if you do want a sequence i run courses go and join them that way you will get a sequence list of videos in that order and uh, you get to learn without any other distractions you get to support me and you will get what you want without having to go through all of this when i create a course i sit down and i write down the lesson plan and then i just make that but when i make a youtube video my thinking is oh this feature or this topic or this particular concept is interesting let me make a video about that i don't really think how is this concept related to those other 17 concepts on my channel it's not relevant at all i just think about that as alone and for that reason there is no sequence of videos uh, hopefully that is helpful i run courses on excel and power bi separately check them out many people buy these courses every month they they get helped a lot they learn what they want and get more out of their work through these tools so if you want to learn and you are thinking i need a structured plan I, I want something without any distractions i want all the sample files i want completed workbooks i want uh, clear tips and step by step instructions and all of that courses will definitely help you um Rajan asks, uh, can you please guide me how to use X, Y, R in function more than two conditions at a time? What are you trying to do with X, Y, R? <clears throat> I have not used X, Y, R in Excel or Power BI or other stuff in a long time. I know what it does, but uh, I don't really come across that many questions where that has to be used. So can you give me an example of what you're trying to do? I'll watch for your follow-up comment. Uh, the XD Sunny says, do you use Alteryx Chandu? If you do, please make a video series on it. Unfortunately, I don't use Alteryx. I don't even know what it does. I mean, I kind of know what it does, but not beyond the headline stuff. So yeah, not something that I could talk about. Utkarsh says, please visit India. All your viewers are going to welcome you. Thank you so much for that lovely gesture, Utkarsh. Uh, we are planning to come back to India again at the end of this year. So last year I was there, uh, on last year and then this Jan, and I ran a meetup in Hyderabad. Uh, we had um, quite a few people show up and, you know, um, we took lots of selfies, talked with lots of, lots of you. So it was fun. Hopefully again this year I'll try to do a meetup uh, the purpose of going to india for me is to meet my family my mom my in-laws my brother so when i'm there my focus is them and uh, i don't like to spend time outside doing much <laughs> mm, but uh, if possible I'll, I'll arrange for something again at the end of this year matt says thank you for the live stream and many great posts over the year Thank you so much, Matt, for that lovely comment. And uh, thank you so much for all your comments, all your love and appreciation all this time. Digital Ganguly says, Namaskara Chandu, loving your new look with braces. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm also enjoying it, but uh, you know, sometimes it gets too painful with the wires touching the skin inside and you know, just. <coughs> but yeah, I'm enjoying it. Um, my kids seems to enjoy it as well. And I'm able to eat a lot better now than one month ago. 
um thanks for creating awesome content fabric comes into picture what sort of skill set you recommend along with core power bi skills example sql spark etc i think um especially if you think you know you will be in the data world for the next few years or next decade or for the rest of your life it's it's always a good idea to learn new things in the data platforms and expand your knowledge and then figure out how these new things connect with what you already know one of the things that i always say to anybody like my students my family my kids is don't stress about what to learn like if you have if you are given four four options and you're 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 always like analyzing or oh, should i learn power bi tableau or sql or python oh, this is better than that but that is used here and, and you know you are doing that it's not productive at all it's not helping you it's not helping anyone instead you know just pick one it doesn't matter what it is or pick one whatever you need to immediately use just learn that so let's say you start you know power bi then you're left with the other three now that you know power bi you don't have to actively learn it again and again i mean you you do need to know what is happening on a monthly update but again you don't need to know that every month once a six months you can just catch up and then see oh this is new i'm going to use that and that's pretty much it so once you finish learning something you have all this extra free time that you can use uh, to either have fun in your life like pick up a new hobby or spend time with your family or do something or maybe take a little bit of that time and then focus on other things so once you learn something you don't have to learn it again you learn use the time to learn other things so instead of analyzing and comparing we now know four technologies after the first two years of learning so that's how it works uh, like you said you already know this what else can we learn uh, my suggestion is maybe pick sql sql seems to be here to stay uh, like I, I i just can't believe i learned sql the very first time in 1996 or 97 and i thought by 1999 i thought oh this is it i don't have to use sql again fast forward to 2002 and 3 again in college i was learning that then i thought okay this is it i i'm going to join as a software developer i don't need to use database stuff anymore 6 months into the job i'm forced to do all these reports again learn sql and then i did my management degree worked as a business analyst i thought okay no more sql for me uh, as a business analyst i never really did any coding but i had to know limitations or possibilities of sql when i write proposals and all of that and then i started my business on excel so i like okay this is it i no more sql for me i can delete all those sql stuff from my mind and then we moved to new zealand 2016 and then i get my first consulting opportunity here for the government agency in the very first day i was given this 20 page query and then said this is what we are using again sql so 2016 to 2023 i'm using sql pretty much every week now so yeah sql could be a good way to enhance your knowledge and if you if you enjoy doing technical stuff and talking to computers maybe learn coding coding is a lot of fun it uh, it it kind of rewires your mind into thinking about possibilities and it's it's fun to learn if you have got kids you know it's fun to learn with them uh, build stuff on computer just for fun or for amusement or you know doing stuff so yeah those are some of the things that i would definitely pick uh, and then see which way the wind blows and pick up whatever technologies along way and then add them to a pile of things and then slowly work through that as you as you progress through life all the best mm. okay this is a question from rajan comes back with that i want to calculate total discount for conditions in multiple columns 
but only if one condition met exclusively discounts given to customer if he had said yes only to one offer out of three plus um okay i mean ideally if i am doing this what i would do is if i am saying exclusively one out of three or four or five um, let's uh, jump to my screen we can try it's a bit hard to make stuff up here so i'm just going to open excel and uh, show that to you the process would be pretty much similar in power bi as well uh, so offer one and uh, all right so we'll make a random array of uh, 10 by 5 and then okay so we got some random data here uh, like for example here you can see this guy has said yes to only that he said no to everything uh, they have said yes to these two things so discount now if i'm doing this i i the easiest thing for me to do would be just to see how many yeses are there and if the number of yeses is one then we are getting a discount else no uh, we don't need to use XOR um, because it can get a little bit clumsy like that. In Excel, I would use counters. I'll just count number of S's and, uh, and write an if condition there. If this is equal to one, uh, discount no soup. So we'll know where that is happening and who else is not getting the discount. So that's really the easiest way. Like if I'm doing this in Power BI, obviously we can't use counters. Uh, we would then use, um, if it's like a finite number of things, I could make a, a conditional column or whatever, or, or write a condition in Power Query that simply checks how many yeses are there but if you have got like 25 offers then the condition will become too much then what i'll do is i'll unpivot this first and then i'll um i'll then create a group table that has yes and no and then just filter out the s yes rows and then see how many counts are there and based on that i'll decide the discount i uh, hope that makes sense uh, it's like you can see, I'm not using XOR at all. Um, but if you want, you can use XOR. Uh, it's not really meant when you have multiple things and I'm not even sure exactly how it works. So let's read the help to see what happens when you have multiple conditions, uh, more than two. Because with two, it will be uh, only if one is true, then it will be true. Yeah, so here you can see that the result of XOR is true when the number of true inputs is odd and false when the number of inputs is even. So when you have more than two conditions on XOR, it doesn't really check for exclusively one. It checks how many, how many trues are there. And if that number of trues is odd, like if I give four, then if three of them are true, then it will be true. One is true, then it will be true. Otherwise it will be false. So it's not exactly what I want. Uh, normally in business settings, we never have this kind of order even scenario. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to use that. And I believe the DAX one will also have the same syntax and same signature. So there is no point using it like that. Uh, hopefully that uh, gave you some idea. All right. Um, 
It's about an hour and a half into this. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this Q&A session and, uh, and a little bit of demo and explanation and all of that. I know I haven't been able to get to a lot of questions, but I was able to answer many of them. So I'm happy with the way this went. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this live. Next month, we'll do another live stream where uh, we're going to do some sort of a actual technology stuff rather than Q&A kind of a thing. Um, but I wanted to try the Q&A for a while because there's lots of small, small questions that keep coming up. And I'm like, um, I don't want to answer them as part of something else. So this was an opportunity. It was good to meet you all and uh, help you out as well as hear from you and get to know you a little bit more and and have all of these lovely thoughts and messages so thank you so much for watching and i'll catch you again somewhere else uh, there's a few more messages but uh, um, There's as a line from one who we found the best it goes like Pepsi Cola Lollipop Apna Chindu Sabse Top. That's so funny. Thank you, man. Uh, Karthik says, where can I enroll in you for your course? Uh, if you go to my website, you'll find the courses information. I'm gonna quickly show you where that information is. So this is a program called Power BI Playdate. Uh, if you go to the Power BI course page, you're gonna find that. And uh, yeah, check out the um, coverage. It kind of covers pretty much everything within Power BI, like Power Query, Power Pivot, DAX, uh, M coding, you know, visual design, report design, dashboard design, everything uh, in one place. And, uh, and people really love this course so if you want sign up uh, i also have an excel course that you can bundle with this and uh, pay in one go either in dollars or us rupees whatever you prefer and uh, yeah sign up for that uh, so that information is on my website but i'll put a link to that in the chat as well And uh, yeah, a few other things uh, like, can you create a series of video on how to use chat GPT for solving Excel and Power BI? I'm tempted to, but I'm also like, uh, I would wait and watch how the space evolves because what we could do with chat GPT in December is different from what we could do in Jan, is different from what we could do now in May. Uh, that technology is changing so fast that, um, there is a lot more hype around it rather than what is really possible. I mean, uh, so I, I don't want to add stuff to it just for the sake of getting some views. So maybe I'll, I'll add, but I, I mean, nothing wrong with getting views. It's just, I feel like uh, it's, it's a little like unstable. So I want to wait for the thing to mature before I could do uh, produce some videos and explain how we can work with that better hopefully makes sense but uh, there's lots of other videos out there so watch them learn and use them all right thank you so much uh, my coffee is nearly over and uh, it's 6 40 now so i'll wrap this up and um, enjoy my weekend i wish you all a fun weekend and uh, we'll catch you again somewhere else uh, there'll be regular videos on the channel and uh, a live stream at the end of the month as well if you have been here all this while and you've been through all the questions and now you're still here thank you so much for your uh, your support and your love and i'll see you again somewhere else